Perhaps no one in my life was as influential as my great-grandmother. We called her Great Nanny. Uh, great Nanny lived to be uh, over 100 years old, and I had the privilege of knowing her for most of my adult life thus far. What a gift. What a gift from, from such a great lady. I, I remember growing up that, that she was a, a very fun person to go and visit. I, I can remember uh, evacuating for a, a hurricane once and staying at her house at Hilltop Lakes, and one of our great joys and one of her favorite things was to watch the deer out her picture window. And so there were several times a day that they would come up and we would always be ready to do that. And she was always ready to have us there uh, to enjoy them as well. She drove a pink Cadillac. <laughs> really, not a Mary Kay one. I mean, she, she had a pink Cadillac and it was like a land yacht. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, the one day we went to visit and the pink Cadillac had a new paint job. And we asked her why. She said, oh, I just felt like it was time. We suspected maybe she got in an accident and didn't tell anybody. But, but uh, she, she got a new paint job. Uh, she is really one of the most authentic and genuine and real people I've ever met. And that was probably the most enduring quality about her. Uh, one of my favorite memories was talking to her about Valentine's Day at the Lodge at Hilltop Lakes. And she loved the Lodge there. It was the central gathering place, this restaurant. Uh, where the, the community would gather just for fun, you know, dominoes and bunko and, and a lot of fun things. But this particular year, she went to the Valentine's event. We said, how was it, Great Nanny? And she said, oh, it was great. I had a great time with my friends, and I wore my red dress with the slit up the side. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she was in her 80s, I mean, or probably 90s at the time. I mean, she just, she was live wire and spunky, and she just was going to be who she was, and nobody was going to change her. At every holiday that we did together, she was the first in line to get Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner or Easter meal or, or whatever. And we always knew, you don't get in front of Nanny, because she will run you over. And, and she would. But nanny was approachable because of her authenticity. She was somebody that I knew I could be real with, and she would be real with me in return. She wouldn't always, she, she would tell me like it was. She wouldn't just say, oh, that's nice, or, you know, oh, whatever. She would say, you know, you know you shouldn't have been doing that, right? She would just tell you like it is, but then she would love you through it. And there was something about that that really shaped my life. In fact, her presence in my life and her influence in my life was a really big reason that I answered my call to ministry. For you see, what was central in her life was her faith. She would go and worship every Sunday she was able at the little church there at Hilltop Lakes, and, and that was the center of her existence. She loved it. She, her soul was fed. Her life was shaped by going every single week, and she would talk to me about her church. She even invited me to come play my saxophone once there when I was a youth, uh, and that was a really great experience as well. Something in me longed for something like that in my life, to be in my 80s, my 90s, my hundreds, and to still be shaped by that kind of faith. I had the privilege, after returning from seminary, to, to go in the nursing home where she was the last couple of years in her life, and to, when she was able to talk, to have conversations with her and to pray with her, and, and I was thankful to have had those precious moments with her to continue to allow her to shape my faith even in her last days. We all need a great nanny in our lives, don't we? And many of you, I know, are thinking about who that person is for you today. Well, during this season of Lent, uh, beginning with Ash Wednesday, we're reminded that as we bring our brokenness to the cross of Christ, Jesus begins to heal us so that he can fill us with living water. But Jesus doesn't just fill us to the brim with living water. When he begins to pour it into us, do you know what happens? We begin to overflow. It begins to spill out of us, and it begins to shape our relationships and shape the reality around us. Our sermon series is Reclaiming Authenticity. As you can see from our picture, something old that still has relevance today. And we're working with this idea that we were born unfiltered. I mean, just look at my three-year-old. He's as unfiltered as it gets. Uh, he says whatever it is that's on his mind. He's even now our, our future attorney. Uh, he'll tell us, well, when I get to, to nursery, I don't want to obey my teachers. And then we can have a conversation, but we think, well, gosh, at least he's honest, right? Uh, we can talk about it before he does it. Uh, but somewhere along the way, we lose our ability to be unfiltered. We, we lose our authenticity. And maybe it's because we begin to, to mediate social expectation. Maybe it's because we try to conform in a certain way to what we think are the expectations around us. We don't want to be too far afield. We don't want to let kind of our brokenness show. And so we, we try to give people this facade, this kind of unblemished projection of who we are. 
When we do that, it begins to change who we are inside. It begins to shape us. It, it leads us to feeling isolated and lonely and even depressed and angry and to feel shame over some certain things that are going on in our lives. And so to get back to this place where we can reclaim authenticity, we've learned that we've got to give up things like control, the control of every situation and everything around us. We have to give up perfectionism, always having to put up this facade, always having to look like things are perfect because it'll drive us crazy, right? And we need to take on things like compassion for ourselves and for others. And today we're going to learn about taking on the practice of connection because as Christians, our life flows out of our connection with God and is sustained by our connection with one another. I want to dig deep in that concept today because there's so much for our Christian life. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them with me and, and turn to John chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14. Please join me as we read together. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you can bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep your commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. So one of my jobs this weekend was to retame my lawn. All over there's clover popping up and those dandelions and cacti and that's plural of cactuses, right? Cacti. Uh, all that's grown up and, you know, having little kids that, I mean, just the other day Nathaniel put grass in his mouth. I thought, well, I don't want to poison the weeds, so I just have to pull them up. So if you drove by me, you probably saw me wrestling the cactuses, cacti that were in the ground. Well, one of the things I knew I had to do was to tame my climbing roses. And they had gotten out of hand. I mean, so much so that when I mowed, uh, it was pricking my skin as I walked by. I thought, I've got to do something about this. I mean, they got all mangled and tangled, and they had grown up. One, a couple of the canes had grown up over the fence and were kind of waving at the neighbors across the fence. And, and consequently, that was the most beautiful part of the plant, so I kind of didn't want to cut it. I got my hands <clears throat> all cut up working with those roses. I mean, the thorns even poked through the gloves. But if those roses were to be even more fruitful, if they were to produce the beautiful flowers that I've cultivated them to produce, they needed to be pruned. And they needed to be tied to the trellises so they could get the light that they needed and grow up to the beautiful blooms. I noticed some things as I was working with that mangled mess. First, thorns really hurt. Uh, second, uh, some of the canes had grown so heavy that they had snapped off and failed to receive life from the vine. And so they withered and died. And I had to cut them off and throw them away. They were good for nothing. Uh, we don't have any fire to burn them with. I'm sure the League, city of League City really appreciates that, so they're just going in the dumpster. Uh, but that's, that's where they belong. They're not going to produce any more flowers. But in cultivating those plants, I realized something else, that some of the branches were holding other branches up that otherwise would have sagged and snapped. And I realized that with all of our thorns and with all of our brokenness and with all of our troubles in this life, sometimes we need one another to hold each other up, don't we? Sometimes that's how we stay connected to the vine. And that's what we're talking about today, this importance of connection. From our very earliest days, we are created for connection. 
I can remember being with Gabriel, our son, who's seven months old when he was born. And in the hospital, the day after he was born, I had him in my lap and I was talking to him and interacting with him. And he would stick out his tongue a little bit, like that. And then I would stick out my tongue at him. And then I would wait and he, you could see the gears were turning, in, as they do in a one-day-old infant. And then he would go, stick out his tongue back at me. From the very first day of his life, he began to interact. It didn't take long before he was interacting with smiling. I would smile at him and then he would smile back. Now it's gotten to the place, it grew, to where if we're talking to our three-year-old or Rachel and I are talking to each other at the table, Gabriel will go, ah, 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 you know, his cutest sounds that he can make in order to get our attention and to direct it toward him. We, something in us innately craves connection. It innately craves connection. Now, Brene Brown defines connection this way. She's a researcher at the University of Houston. She's a social worker. But she looks at vulnerability and is trying to get at this place where, where we live so far apart that we've gotten to a place in our society where you know, we're right and everybody else is wrong, it seems, and it's hard to come to the middle. And so she's dedicated her life to trying to figure out how to get us to turn toward each other and take some steps uh, toward the center again so we can relate. And she says that connection is the place where we feel valued, where we feel heard and understood and loved that gives us energy and strength to live our life. Have you felt that sense of true connection? That sense where you're truly heard and understood and valued and loved? Where you get the strength and energy to live out your life? That's something that we all innately need. I pray that Gabriel and Nathaniel get that from us now as little children. But when they turn 12, 13, 14, 25, 30, I pray that they'll still continue to seek that out. I hope they, they know that they can find it in us, but I hope that they seek out a few people in their lives that they can truly be open and vulnerable with, like my great nanny, because I, I'm very grateful for her. But connectedness for us as Christians starts with connection to the vine. We have to stay connected to Jesus in order to, to properly connect with one another. And an important distinction for us is, is staying connected to God isn't just showing up once a week. And it's not just praying when things get tough, but it's an ongoing daily walk with God. I love Exodus 33. It talks about Moses conversing with God face to face as a friend would with a friend. I want that kind of connection to God. Don't you? Where God, you'd only talk to God in that way, without the walls built up, but you hear God speaking back to your soul and shaping you. Wouldn't that be your desire to get there? To talk with God as friend would with a friend? And what's interesting is you continue to read the scriptures, the people were actually frightened when Moses came out of the tent after meeting with God because his face was radiant. Now, I don't want you to frighten anybody, certainly, but wouldn't it be great if others saw the fruit of your faith in that way? the fruit of a radiant relationship with God? I think that's the goal. And we can get there. Because you see, connection with the vine, connection with Jesus Christ begins with three things. Worship, study, and prayer. Now, at first, those three things seem so obvious, right? Well, here's another sermon about spiritual practices, but it's so very true. Worship opens us up, opens the line of communication up with God. And very often, you come into worship and you don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes things might have gone royally wrong during your week. I mean, you may be coming off of a job loss or have a sick relative or worried about something or, or just not feeling it. But when you come with the regular discipline to give God thanks and praise, all of a sudden your spirits are lifted and you begin to see, God, you were working behind the scenes all along. And you begin to leave saying, I'm going to live a life of gratitude in the week ahead. Worship. It changes everything. And I can't emphasize enough that in this day and age where, where folks are coming to worship one day a week, your soul is going to become parched and your, your branch is going to begin sagging, right? You need that ongoing uh, relationship with God week in and week out. But second, you need study. And study for us is not an intellectual exercise. I mean, it's great to know facts and figures. It, it is. Dig into the Word. Get as much out of it as you can. That part is important. Greek and Hebrew word study are also important because it helps you enter into the world in which the text was written. 
Do all of those things. But when you read for connection, you've got to read with the eyes of your heart opened. You've got to have your ears uh, ready to receive a word from God. You've got to read the scripture with an eye toward what it is saying to you in your life, in what you are going through in that moment. To read it and ask the question, God, what does this tell me about your relationship with me? What does this scripture teach me about God and who I am in Jesus Christ? And then pray, God, thank you for shaping me and filling me with your word. Help me to follow you faithfully all the days of my life. You've got to do the head work, certainly, so that in those times that you're devoting and having your personal worship time with God, you can do the hard heart work as well. The third way you stay connected to the vine is through prayer. And at first glance, you go, well, yeah, but prayer in maybe a different way than we're used to doing it. Now, a lot of us pray like uh, the, the, you're going down the freeway at 80 in a 65. Not that any of you would do that, or I would. Uh, and then you see the state trooper sitting on the top of the hill, and you go, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. That, that's a lot of the way that we pray, right? We wait, we wait until we're in a crisis situation, and then we go, God, please bail me out. I know I haven't talked to you in a long time, uh, but I need you now. And God, God will answer those prayers. And maybe not in the way that we always want, but God will answer those prayers. But wouldn't it be great if when you got to those, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please moments, and you look back in your rear view and, and hope that the red and blue aren't flashing and the car's not pulling out? Uh, what if you had a deep relationship before those oh, please moments, right? That's where the rubber meets the road. It's conversing with God as a friend would with a friend, but it's being vulnerable before God because you know that God knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. You know, he knows what you're going to do before you even do it. And he knows what you did even if you don't tell him. And so we need to be to a place where every day we can lay our souls bare before God. Lord, I know I missed the mark here today. God, please forgive me. And give me the strength to go and ask for forgiveness from the person that I've wronged. That's the kind of connection that leads us to a healthy place of connecting with others. But it has to start with that kind of honest confession daily before God. I want to ask you in this moment, how are you doing at confessing your sins before God? Are, are you taking the time every day to do that? I'm not talking a laundry list and beating yourself up, but I'm, I'm saying that, that that's how we grow, right? The first step is admitting that you have places that you want to go and places that you've missed the mark. Look closely at that because the goal is, is service. Because remember, when we bring our brokenness to the cross of Christ, Jesus mends us and heals us so that we can overflow with living water. Here's where the rubber meets the road. We love to help other people. We're connected to one another through the vine. And our fellow branches need love and joy and mercy and support. And we love to do those things. But what you've allowed to be poured into you is what you have available to pour out. What you've allowed to be poured into you through your connection to the vine is what you have available to pour out. And if you haven't confessed your sins openly to God and, and you're trying to keep up this facade, then you're going to be drawn from an empty well. Social media is a very interesting phenomenon today. Uh, it, it's a great place to build your facade, isn't it? And have you seen that? What do we put on social media? We put our vacation pictures on there. We put, you know, the, I love to put videos of my children laughing and playing. We don't put our morning, morning hair and oil changes on Facebook, do we? No, because... We don't want to present that part of our lives publicly. And then when we watch for likes, and now with these smartphones, your system tray gets every, every time somebody likes, you go, ooh, you know, or somebody commented on your, your post, you go, oh, I want to see what they said. And you get a little dopamine shot in your brain. But if we're not careful, we're going to mistake that type of connection with true, real, authentic sharing of your life with somebody else. You're just sharing snapshots. So if you want to deeply connect, snapshots, that's right. So I love this call and response. I love having him in here. And so if you truly want to get to a place where you're being poured into so you'll have something substantive to pull out, it starts with confession to God, but it starts with having a great nanny in your life. Somebody that you can go to and you can say, I messed up big time. In a way, from a person who's going to say, not, that's okay, bless your heart, not that kind of person. You, don't go to them. What, the person that you want to go to, honestly, if you want to get to this place, is the person who's going to say, I can see that this is affecting you deeply, and I know that, that you can do better, and you know that too. 
Uh, this person is, is somebody who's going to be non-judgmental, going to offer mercy with truth, and is going to walk with you to the place that God has prepared for you. Do you know those types of people in your life? Those folks who will shoot you straight when you know that you have failed to do something? The kind of person who will say, I know you may feel angry, but you need to go and apologize. Those people? Think for just a moment who those folks are in your life. Maybe it's time for a conversation this week. Maybe an email or a phone call or, hey, can you have a cup of coffee? I need to talk. Because when you admit that you need help, when you open yourself up to be poured into, your well is going to be so much deeper. Because all of a sudden, you're going to experience that love and joy that God gives you through the vine lived out in human community. And that, my friends, is the goal. A redeemed earth. And that starts here in, in the church. It starts here with your brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be nurtured as fellow branches connected to the vine before we can overflow outside of the church into the world. Today's a very special day for, for me. I've got my, my family sitting here uh, to my right, and we're going to baptize my son Gabriel. And it, for, for a dad, there's no greater joy than to welcome him into the church because I know that I've been nurtured through the church my entire life. Uh, when I've done wrong, I always had people that I could go to and trust who could shoot me straight and lift me up. Uh, when I wanted to serve and find places to pour my life into something even bigger than I would ever know, the church provided avenues for me to do that. They helped me find a place to repent of my sin. They, they helped me to walk and to grow in faithfulness and in my knowledge and understanding of God's word. Uh, so I want to say thank you, first and foremost, for what you're about to do in receiving my son into your presence. Because in a moment, you're going to vow to help raise him in the faith, to which point he understands what it means that Jesus died for him. What it means to, to not only be saved once and for all, but to be saved every single day through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in his life. He's joining this redemptive community. And my prayer is that he will never know a day without the love and the truth and the mercy of Jesus Christ at work within his life. There's no greater joy than that. I was shaped profoundly by my great nanny and by Kip, who's going to come up here in a moment to lead my family in exchanging our vows, and, and by all of those saints who have helped me be faithful to my calling. And I pray that in your life, in this church, in your family and in your relationships, you can find those people who will lift you up too, so that you'll be free to love and serve Christ in this world. Will you join me as we pray? Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being connected to you. For through our connection with the vine, we receive love and we receive joy, mercy, grace, and forgiveness and truth, God. Continue to sustain us with your word and your Holy Spirit. And now as we come to welcome Gabriel into your household, God, connect him to the vine, sustain him with love and mercy and grace so that he can be faithful to you all the days of his life. Help us, Lord, to grow spiritually as a church, to become more and more like Jesus every day so we can offer something of substance to a world so desperately in need of your love. God, we thank you for all that you're doing, and we look forward to all the ways you're going to help us carry this message out into the world. We're praying all this in Jesus' name. Amen.